this momentum. Um, and so the momentum points is, a, is a, um, a method for keeping score of attaining these milestones. So that's one example. Um, some other examples. The American Association of Colleges and Universities um, has what they call completion qu plus quality. And if you go to this site, you can see some of the, uh, the criteria that they use to say, well, completion is not enough. We also want students to be able to do these other things. There's an interesting initiative at Georgetown University called Formation by Design, which is getting back to the um, liberal arts, in, in their case also Jesuit, because they're a Jesuit institution, the notion of we're not just educating you to get you a job. We're educating the whole person. We want you to be able to have other kinds of skills, life skills, um, character skills, um, critical thinking skills, that sort of thing. So that's an, another example of how they're trying to improve retention because they feel that with cyber symbiosis and the rise of digital technologies, this is how they're going to distinguish themselves from the other institutions. That is their value proposition. That's what makes them different from other schools. And I encourage you also to look at this paper, Reconceptualizing um, uh, Nora and Chris. It talks about um, what do we need to know uh, in order to achieve greater success for Latino students. And one of the concepts they have is reconceptualizing student success, not just in terms of cognitive outcomes, but in terms of uh, behavioral and psychological outcomes. So they're also looking at broadening their definition beyond just, you know, did you pass the courses? I also, this is a favorite, this is really, I was trying to avoid the term thinking outside the box because I know it's dead, beaten to death. But this is uh, something I also would like you to consider as well. I talk about it more in the paper. Acknowledging the value of non-completion. Among the things I found in, the, in my research for the book and for this paper is that, for example, uh, Middlesex Community College in Massachusetts, um, did a study and found that 90% of their students uh, attained their personal goals whether or not they passed their courses or got a degree. There's a study in here that indicates even when students who do not finish a degree still earn something like $100,000 more over their lifetimes than uh, students who don't ever go to college. And also, there's a very interesting article by Tom Hanks. Anybody knows Tom Hanks, the famous actor? Did you know he went to community college? He went to community college and he said he didn't graduate from community, community college, but he said it was essential to him moving forward. So the next time you see him in a movie, it's thank community college, because he says it had a role in this. So I think we have to acknowledge, and then you have the extreme, which I think is a, a little bit misleading. You have the, the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates and the folks that are extremely talented and leave college and, and then go on to do great things. I think that's a little misleading, but it's still useful to know that there is a value in non-completion. My personal feeling is that if you as a college, if you as a person working at a college, had a hand in that success, you should get some credit for it. You shouldn't just get beaten up for it. And also, in this regard, I will mention, in, when you see articles about this, remember that the way we count uh, success and uh, completion is still wrong. I don't think they fixed it yet. I didn't learn this until maybe 10 years ago where I learned that I was a negative retention statistic. I went to one college, um, the University of Pennsylvania, and then I transferred to Oberlin College and graduated. And I'm not counted because that's the way the system works. They don't count. Um, so I, and I'm looking at the, the schools that many of you represent. I know many of you work at institutions that serve the harder to serve. And sometimes I see some of your institutions getting beaten up, like, well, you only have a 30% uh, degree rate. You only have a 10% you know, rate. Well, it all depends on who you're serving, and it all depends on, especially now, especially community colleges, students come in and then they leave, and they get what they want. They don't need a degree or something. So you should get credit for that as well. All right. Two more stories. Finding successful assessment. One of my favorite stories in this regard is with my colleague, Joan McMahon, uh, who is um, a professor emeritus at Towson University, and she uh, used to teach in their human resources development program. And she tells the story about how 
Um, she was teaching and her students were doing okay. And then she went and got some training. In fact, somebody asked me about this. She went and did quality matters training um, and about how to do her courses better and how to teach better. And she found that her students started doing better and then they were all getting A's or A's and B's. And then eventually her dean called her in. So John, you know, we have a problem here. Like, what's the problem? It's like, well, you know, it looks like maybe you're getting a little too lax with your grading. You know, your students are getting, you know, too, too high grades. Work. Well, no, I, I'm just doing what you told me to do. It's like, what do you mean? Well, you said I should go get professional training to become a better teacher. So I went and got professional training, and I became a better teacher. And when I became a better teacher, my students did better. Well, duh. <laughs> that is the way it's supposed to work. Contrast that with another story from another institution um, that I heard of, where they have this educational technology program. I don't even remember the technology they used. It was an, an information technology class. They did this new technology uh, that they applied to the teaching, and the students did much better on the class, on the course, and the tests. And so the professor said, oh, I guess I'm gonna have to change my tests to make them harder because you have to preserve the curve. Well, I can't have all my students be successful. We have to sort them out. Why? <laughs> because that's the way elite institutions seem to think. This, to me, is an example of a legacy practice that's getting in the way of broadening the definition of student success. They succeeded. They, they snatched defeat the from the jaws of the success, from the jaws of victory in doing this. So what are the issues here? what I call sorting versus learning. And I like to say, students are not eggs. We treat them like eggs. Oh, you're a grade A egg. Oh, you're only a grade B egg. Oh, man, you're, oh yeah, we're gonna throw you out and feed you to the chickens. Um, too often we confuse sorting and learning. And I think there is a place for sorting, but it needs to be, we need to do more performing and less sorting. Um, we need to do less of this norming, less of this I, uh, idea like, well, you know, uh, like the George, uh, I'm sorry, like the story I told you about. And what I've called attainment deflation, which is what I was referring to earlier, this danger of um, the idea that we lower our standards in order to achieve our goals. We've seen this in the K through 12 arena with no child left behind. There's um, uh, a sociology uh, professor, whose last name is Campbell, who did this Campbell's theorem, I believe it's called. But basically it shows if you, if you create a system with high stakes, the higher the stakes, the more people will cheat. And this is exactly what we've seen with No Child Left Behind. They say, oh, we found this example of it happening. Wasn't that terrible in Atlanta or wherever it was? Well, then it turned out it was Atlanta, it was Texas, it was all over the place. Because that's exactly what the system is designed to produce whether or not the people who created the system know this or not. One of the dangers of the completion agenda is, what is the easy, I'll tell you the easiest way. What's the easiest way to meet the completion agenda? Congratulations, you all have diplomas. Vaya con Dios. <laughs> That's the easiest way. Of course, we would never do that, but there's, there's, there are pressures in that direction. So how do we define successful assessment more broadly? One way is e-portfolios. This is a diagram of a colleague of mine, Nancy Wozniak, who was at SUNY Stony Brook. She just moved somewhere else. I've forgotten where. But how many of you are familiar with e-portfolios? How many of you like e-portfolios? How many of you don't like e-portfolios? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's perfect. But they allow you to have a broader definition of student success. Instead of, um, number one, the incorrect answer is B, number two, the correct answer is B, number three, the correct answer is A, now you have a much richer way of defining student success. And for those of you who already know this, I don't have to say anything more. For those of you who don't, find someone who does. <laughs> Now, I apologize in advance. I hate when presenters do this. What is he doing? I can't read this. Don't worry about it. You don't have to read it. I'm just showing this as an example of uh, impact assessment, which is a concept that my colleague, Joan McMahon, developed. And she and I have worked on this. So we developed this for Quality Matters, actually. And I show this as an example of impact assessment, 
which is the idea that you can assess students not just on cognitive in outcomes, not just on behavioral and psychological outcomes, as the Nora and Chris papers say, but you can look at a wide variety of outcomes pertaining to their future career, future education, their life. And you can do the same thing for an institution as well. And this is an example of what these are, the, the green boxes. These are ways, this is a, a, a process where institutions can use acts, um, uh, action research to assess the impact of quality matters on their institution. So they can look at faculty transformation, they can look at um, administrative support, they can look at student success, they can look at um, institutional policies and culture, et cetera. There's a lot of different ways to define success more broadly, and this is a, a model that we've developed. And again, um, I can add, provide in, uh, information about details if you want, and uh, you can, if you get the slide, you can actually read this one. There are also cross-cutting strategies. Um, that is, I've described some of these strategies as fitting into one of the themes, whether it's access, retention, or assessment, but there are some of these obviously go beyond, uh, like e-portfolios go beyond just simple you know, assessment. It also impacts retention uh, and access as well. But this is some ex examples that I like. Um, the first two, student-generated content. Um, it improves the transparency of content because now you have students involved in the production of it. Instead of expert authenticated content, which comes down from um, Zeus, I believe is where it comes from. Olympus is where you know, most of it comes from. Um, instead, they have a say in developing it. We all know the maxim that um, if you want to learn something, teach it. You, you teach, if you teach something, you learn it better. Why not apply that to changing the software in our computer? <laughs> It also improves retention because it increases engagements. It gives more students skin in the game, as it were. It gives more students um, uh, an opportunity to be engaged in the process. We know this principle in adult learning. Uh, Malcolm Lowell's told us about it, self-directed learners. Why not apply it more often in undergraduate and graduate education as well? And assessment. Uh, I've worked on projects, for example, where um, a project at North Carolina State University and Old Dominion University, where they set up a system, a, a, a computer system, which helps automate the process of peer